Hello guys, uh, I am Ram Prasad from BTEC second year from the CSC department. I'll be taking today's CAP session on the topic introduction to cryptography and uh, stenography. So well going into details, so let us first try to understand what basically is the term cryptography means. So coming to the term cryptography, so cryptography is nothing but uh, a technique of securing and communicating the information through the uses of the code so that only the person who had sent the information and who had received the information can understand it. So basically cryptography is composed of the two terms where crypto is nothing but hidden and graphy is nothing but writing. Let us now try to understand some of the basic terms through the given diagram. For the time being, let us consider Alice to be sender of some message and Bob to be the receiver. Alice sends some message to the Bob and the message which is being sent is in the plain text form. So basically plain text, it is nothing but the original message which is being sent by the, send, by the sender. As soon as the plain text is sent, the encryption algorithm which is present, it performs the various substitutions and transformations on the plain text. So once the encryption is done, the text which is received after this encryption is nothing but the ciphertext. And ciphertext, okay. So uh, let's come to the secret key. So the secret key is nothing but uh, what you call as an input to the encryption algorithm. The key is a value which is generally independent of the plain text as well as the algorithm. The algorithm will produce a different output depending upon the secret key. Now let's come to the ciphertext. So ciphertext is nothing but the scrambled message which is produced as the output after the encryption algorithm. Decryption algorithm is quite opposite to the encryption algorithm. So decryption algorithm is an algorithm which reverses the ciphertext into the plain text so that the receiver can understand the message which is being sent. Now, you might be thinking what exactly the terms encryption and decryption are. So encryption is nothing but the process of converting the normal message into some meaningless message. And this meaningless message is nothing but your ciphertext. And decryption is the process of converting this meaningless text into the original form so that the receiver can understand the message. Since we have gone through the basic terminologies, let us now try to see the different types of the cryptography. In general, there are two types of cryptography. The first one is the symmetric key cryptography. The name itself indicate that the public key and the private key, both these keys will be same. So in order to explain it in a much more easier way, so in this case, the sender and the receiver of the message use a common key to encrypt as well as decrypt the message. So these symmetric key systems, these are quite faster and simpler. But the problem with this is that the sender and the receiver should somehow exchange their key in a safe and secure manner so that their messages are not intercepted by some other third party person. The most popular symmetric key cryptography system is the data encryption system. The next one is the asymmetric key cryptography. So under this system, a pair of keys is used to encrypt and decrypt the information. So a public key is used for the encryption and a private key is used for the decryption of the data. Public key and private key are different from each other. Even though if someone comes to know regarding the public key, only the intended receiver would be able to decode the message because he himself has the private key. Now let us see what ex why do we need cryptography and why and what are the needs for cryptography? Now, you all might be thinking, what's the need of cryptography? 
Let's look into it. Cryptography helps us to achieve the following. It helps us to maintain the confidentiality. So whenever you are sending the information, that information which you are sent can only be accessed by the person for whom it was intended to be. And no other person except him can access it. It helps to maintain the integrity. Information which you are sent cannot be modified in storage or transition between the sender and the intended receiver. The third is the non reputation. The creator or sender of the information cannot deny him or his intention to send information at some later stage. The final one is the authentication. The identities of the sender as well as the receiver are confirmed. Apart from this, the destination and origin of the information is also confirmed. Let us now look into the classifications of the symmetric cryptography. There are two types of the traditional symmetric cryptography. The first one is a substitution cipher. So the substitution cipher, they encrypt the plain text by swapping each letters or the symbols in the plain text by some different symbol or something according to the key, whatever they have. Perhaps the simplest substitution cipher is nothing but the Caesar cipher. So coming to the Caesar cipher, in this case, each letter of a given text is simply replaced by some other fixed letter, which is a fixed number of positions apart from it. Let us now try to understand it by some example. For example, if I shift one, like with a shift of one, A would be replaced by B, B would be replaced by C and so on. And this continues. The method is apparently named after Julius Caesar as this was used by his officials for the communication purposes during his era. Some of the other substitution cipher which we have apart from the Caesar cipher are the Playfair cipher, mono alphabetic cipher, poly alphabetic cipher, Verman cipher and etc. Let us now look into the another class of it, which is the tra transposition cipher. The transposition cipher doesn't deal with the substitution of one symbol with another. It simply focuses on changing the position of the symbol in the plain text. A symbol in the first position in the plain text may occur in some other position in the cipher text. So rail fence is a well known example of such transposition cipher. In this rail fence, the plain text is written in some zigzag manner and then written row wise to get the required cipher text. Let us now try to understand it with the following example. If I considered IET and ITK to be the plain text, after encryption, the cipher text which I'll be obtaining will be IT, I, K, E, and T. Wow, what is this? This seems to be something new. I guess you guys would have seen would have seen this machine in some movies. This is nothing but Enigma machine. So this machine is also a cipher device which was developed during the mid 20th century during the World War. And during the World War, it was used by the Nazis for their military communication. This machine was based on the substitution cipher where each character was matched to some another character in the alphabet. This mapping was changed every day so that it becomes difficult for the others to intercept the message. Finally, this the code for this message was broken by a Krypton analyst Allen with the help of a machine that he developed. Until then, it was believed that it's virtually impossible to break this code. Now let us move to the asymmetric cryptography. Asymmetric cryptography, which is also known as the public key cryptography, is a process that uses a pair of related keys. So one is the public key and the another is the private key. And both this public key and private key are used to encrypt and decrypt a message and protect it from the unauthorized access or use. A public key is nothing but a cryptographic key 
that can be used by a person to encrypt a message and this encrypted message can only be decrypted by a person who is having the corresponding private key when someone wants to send an encrypted message they can pull the intended recipient's public key from the public directory and use it to encrypt the message before sending it to him the recipient of the message can then decrypt the message using the rare, their related private key let us now look into some of the asymmetric cryptographic algorithms the first one is the rsa algorithm so the basic idea behind this algorithm is based on the fact that it's quite difficult to factorize very large integers in this case the public key consists of two numbers the one number is a multiplication of the two large prime numbers and private key is also derived from the same two prime numbers so if somebody can factorize a large number the private key is compromised and this has been used extensively in various applications from bluetooth your mastercard visa e banking e communication and all the e commerce platforms now we have defy hellman algorithm and this algorithm is a key exchange protocol that enables the two parties communicating over public channel to establish a mutual secret without it being transmitted over the internet let us now look into the elliptic curve cryptography this is an approach to the public key cryptography based on the algebraic structure of the elliptic curves over the finite fields this allows the smaller keys compared to non ac cryptography to provide the equivalent security let us now move into another interesting topic called hashing now you guys might be wondering what exactly is hashing so hashing is nothing but the process of converting a given key into the another value and the result of this hash function is known as the hash value or simply a hash so a good hashing algorithm uses one way hashing algorithm one way hashing in other words the hash cannot be converted back into the key let us now look into some of the applications of the hashing so the first one is the password verification and storing system in the case of a password verification let us now try to understand the password verification with some example so whenever you are using some online website basically nowadays these online websites require your login details as well as your password to authenticate so when you are trying to use belongings to you and when the password is entered a hash of the password is computed so whatever the password which we are entering a corresponding hash of that password is computed and it is then sent to the server for the verification of the password the password which was previously stored in the server that is not actually your password but it is actually the hashed value of the password which you entered at the initial time and this is done to ensure when the password is sent from client to server no sniffing is done the second application is the message digest application so in this application the cryptographic hash functions produce an output from which reaching the input is close to impossible this property of hash function is known as the irreversibility let us now try to understand this by considering an example suppose you have to store your files on any of the cloud services which are available you have to be sure that your file that you store doesn't get tampered by any third party you do it simply by computing the hash of the file using a cryptography hash algorithms which exist so one of the common cryptography hash algorithm is sha256 which we will be discussing in the upcoming slides so the hash thus computed has a maximum size of 32 bytes or 256 bits so computing the hash of large number of files will not be a problem at all you now save these hashes into your local machine now 
whenever you download the file, you compute the hash again. Then you match it with the previous hash computed and which was stored in your local machine. Therefore, you know whether your file was tampered or not. If anybody tampered your file, the hash value of the file will definitely change. Tampering the file without changing the hash is nearly impossible. The third application is linking file name and path together. Since we are working with computers and laptops, we might be moving through files on our local system and we might have observed two very crucial components of a file. That is the file name and the file path. In order to store the correspondence between the file name and file path, the system uses a map consisting of the file name as well as the file path. And this is implemented by using a hash table. Now let us take a look at what options the companies have to protect your password and safely store it so that even when hackers get access to their systems, your password remains safe and secure. So there are three ways a companies can store your password. They store it either in plain text or they use the encryption on it or they use the hashing technique. Let's quickly go over each one of them and let's start with the most basic one, which is the plain text. So this plain text, it is obviously the most dangerous way of storing password. Since this is a plain text, if hackers breaches a company's database, they will get to see all the passwords of the user. And since a lot of people have the very bad habit of using the same password for multiple accounts, it's likely that one compromised password could lead to more compromised accounts. You might be thinking that companies aren't that silly that none of them store your password in plain text. However, you might be again thinking that how can two passwords be same? And the way how you're thinking is obviously wrong because there are companies, despite of having millions of users, they're not protecting your password. One of the possible way is to convert this plain text into an encrypted text, which takes the password of the users and before storing them into the database, encrypt them with some encryption key. This would prevent hackers from obtaining the real passwords of the user. But still, this process is quite risky because underneath the encryption layer is still the password, which is your plain text. If an attacker manages to steal the encryption key as well, let's see what would be the scenario in that case. So here, in this case, the attacker manages to steal the key. So the problem with this encryption is that it is designed to work in two ways. That is, you can encrypt a user's password to keep it safe, but you can also decrypt it to reveal the password again. So encryption is very practical when you want to share the data in a secure way, but it is definitely not great if you want to prevent attacks from breaching your password. And that brings us the third technique of storing the password, and that is by using a hash function. You might be wondering, how does this work? Well, hash functions take an input. That could be a piece of text or a password, and it could be even a file too, and turns that into a string of text that always has the same and fixed length. Doesn't it seem to be interesting? So let us now look into it. So hash functions, they are very different from encryption because these hashings, they work only in one way. You can calculate the hash of a password, but you cannot take the hash and turn it back into the original data. And that's the interesting property which we should have, isn't it? By using the hashes, companies can verify that you are logging with the correct password 
without having to store your actual password. Even a single change in the character leads to change of the entire hash value. However, they are also not perfect either. As most of the hashing algorithms, they are optimized for the speed purpose. The more hashes per second they can calculate, the better they are treated nowadays. And that makes them vulnerable again from the brute force attacks. By simply trying to calculate every possible password, an attacker can still reverse the hash function. Nowadays, the modern GPUs can do this with a speed of 292 million hashes per second. So it's only a matter of time before a hashed password is cracked using this technique. And if that's not fast enough, attackers can also use the rainbow tables. So these rainbow tables, these are nothing but the tables which contain the pre-computed hashes that can be used quickly to find weak and very commonly used password nowadays. Let us now try to analyze what will happen if two candidates, Alice and Bob, have the same password. If their passwords are same, then the corresponding hashes of the password will also remain same. So when a hacker cracks this password, he will know the other passwords too. Now you might be thinking, mm, it's not a big deal at all because it's very unlikely that different passwords exist. But think again, it seems to be possible. To defend against these attacks, we can add what's called a salt to the password before we hash it. Now you guys might be thinking again, what is the salt? So the salt is just some of the random data which is added to ensure that the hash of your password will always be unique even though you are using the same password. It doesn't matter. So now even if both Alice and Bob have the same password, their hashes will be completely different as both of them have the unique salt. So if an attacker unfortunately cracks Bob's password. He can't link that password with the allies and he has to start cracking the allies password again. This technique prevents the attackers from cracking a bunch of passwords in one go. It makes the brute force attacks slower, but still the attack is possible. So to solve this, we have to look at the third technique which is by using the special hash functions. Let us now look into the special hash functions. So examples of the special hash functions are bcrypt, script, and organ2. And these completely neutralize the brute force attack. These algorithms, they take the password as an input along with salt and cost. Now again, what is this cost? So cost is nothing but the number of rounds the algorithm goes through and this efficiency slows it down. Now over time, our computers become faster and faster. So brute force attacks against these algorithms become very, very easy nowadays. That's because they can try simply more combinations in shorter time span. All we have to do to counter this is to increase the cost parameter so that the algorithm resists against these attacks. If your account has been compromised, it is best if you change your password immediately. However, depending on the security measures of the company that was compromised, it might be possible that the hackers haven't been able to retrieve your password. Ha, that's thanks to magic of hash functions and cryptography in general. So now you know how companies can safely store your password. Let us now look into some of the properties of the hash functions. The first one is the pre-image resistance. So this property means that 
it should be computationally hard to reverse the hash function. The second one is the second pre-image resistance. This property gives an input and its hash. So given an input and a hash, it should be hard to find a different input with the same corresponding hash value. And collision resistance. This property means that it should be hard to find two different inputs of any length that result in the same hash. This property is also referred to as the collision free hash function. Let us now look into some of the popular hashing algorithm. The first one is the MD5 algorithm. So this is technically MD5 message digest algorithm. And the main purpose of this is to verify whether a file is altered or not. So instead of confirming two sets of data are identical by simply comparing the raw data, this algorithm does this by producing a checksum on both the sets and then comparing these checksums to verify whether these values are same or not. If the value aren't same, then it signifies that someone has hampered the data. MD5 has certain flaws, so it is not recommended for the advanced encryption applications, but it's perfectly acceptable to use it for standard file verifications. In the year of 2004, it has been observed that this algorithm even consists of collisions. The next famous algorithm is the secure hash algorithm. So this hashing algorithm is used to convert text of any length into a fixed size string. In this case, given an input text, the corresponding output text will produce a hashed function and hashed value of 512 bits in length or 64 bytes. And this algorithm is very commonly used nowadays in the email addresses hashing, password hashing, and digital record verification as well. Still now, the collision for this algorithm haven't been discovered. Let us now move into another interesting topic, which is technography. So let us first try to understand what exactly is technography. So technography is nothing but the practice of hiding some secret messages inside or even on the top of something which is not secret. Isn't it seem to be interesting? So this is something which can be simply done without anyone's knowing. These days, many examples of stenography involve embedding a secret place of text inside some picture or simply hiding a secret message in Word or Excel document. The purpose of this is to conceal and deceive the data. It is a form of convert communication and involves the use of any medium to hide messages. It's not definitely a form of cryptography because it doesn't involve the scrambling data or the ciphertext in this case. Instead, it is simply a form of hiding the data in a clever way. In stenography, the fact that a secret communication is taking place is generally hidden. While in cryptography, only secret messages is hidden. Let us now try to understand how is this different from the cryptography. Cryptography and stenography are both methods which are used to hide or protect your secret data. However, they differ in respect that the cryptography makes the data unreadable to the interferer or hides the meaning of the data, while stenography simply hides the existence of the data. In simple words, Cryptography is very similar to writing a letter in a secret language. People can read it, but they won't understand what exactly is written inside. However, the existence of a secret message would be obvious to anyone who sees the letter. 
and if someone either knows or figures out your secret language, then your message could be easily read in the case of stenography. If you had to use technography in the same situation, you would hide the letters inside a pair of socks. That would be gifting the intended recipient of the letter. To those who don't know about the message, it would look like there was nothing more rather than a gift, that is socks. But the intended recipient knows what to look for it and he finds the message hidden inside it. Let us now look into the types of the technography. We will, we will be going through this. So the first one is the text technography. The name itself indicates that it is hiding some text inside it. So text technography is hiding the information inside the text files. It basically involves the things like changing the format of the existing text, changing words within a text, generating some random character sequence or simply using the context free grammars to generate the readable text. The image technography. I'll be discussing this image technography in brief in the upcoming slides. Audio technography. In this audio technography, the secret message is embedded into an audio signal which alters the binary sequence of the corresponding audio file. Now comes the video technography. In the case of a video technography, the data is hidden digitally in the video format. The advantage of this is a large amount of data can be hidden inside. You can think of this as the combination of the image technography and audio technography. Let us now try to understand image technography in detail. As the name itself suggests that the image technography refers to the process of hiding the data within an image file. The image selected for this purpose is called as the cover image and the image which is obtained after stenography is called as a stego image. Let us now try to understand in a better way how this is done. An image whatever is there that image is basically represented in the form of a matrix of size n cross n if it is a grayscale image. And in each entry of that matrix, it will be representing the intensity value of a pixel. In image technography, a message is embedded into an image by altering the values of some of the pixels which are chosen by an encryption algorithm. The recipient of the image must be aware of the same algorithm in order to know which pixels he or she must select to extract the proper message. And the detection of this message within the cover image is done by the process of stegno analysis. This can be done through comparison with the image histogram plotting or noise detection. We came to the end of the presentation. Thank you for attending the today's CAP session. Some topics which you came across this session would help you in today's Turing It contest, which would be held today at 3 p.m. Wish you very, very all the best, guys.